As the energy transition progresses and governments around the world start enacting ever stricter uh, policies to limit greenhouse gas emissions, a debate is emerging over the role of carbon pricing, so carbon taxes or cap and trade, versus other policy instruments. So I'm going to be talking today to James Meadowcroft, who is the research director for the Transition Accelerator, and he's uh, talking to us from Ottawa. So welcome to the interview, James. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you today. Now, you've written a study about how Canada needs a paradigm shift in how it approaches climate policy and the energy transition. If you wouldn't mind giving us a brief overview of your study, please. Yeah, so this study is called um, Pathways to Net Zero. And basically what we look at is how over the next couple of dec decades, Canada could move towards uh, a net zero uh, carbon emission or greenhouse gas emission economy. Uh, and uh, what we do is we emphasize that so far, Canada's done quite a bit, but we've tended to do a little bit of everything. And that if we really want to get serious about this, it's much better to focus on the key policies, the key sectors, which we need to move in order to push this trans forward, transition forward across the country. And I guess we particularly emphasis, emphasize that in the Canadian context, it's important to look at regions because the Canadian regions are really different. It's just different talking about this in Quebec with its big hydro economy than it is in Alberta with its oil and gas sector and coal still playing an important role in electricity generation. So it's uh, uh, regional uh, focus is really important, but also sectoral focus because um, getting to net zero involves changes and in a lot of the big systems that provide uh, for social provisioning in our society, like agri-food and like personal transport and heavy goods transport and the electricity system. And these systems each have their own particularities, the obstacles to change are different and also the enabling factors. Now you mentioned regional uh, uh, differences being important. And it also strikes me that there's a constitutional division between in terms of which jurisdiction is responsible for implementing some of these policies. And the provinces, as the prime minister has found uh, with his climate policies, the provinces have a lot of this responsibility and they're sort of you know, part of a region uh, how does that complicate the policymaking approach? So obviously, Canada is uh, one of the countries in the world with one of the more decentralized uh, constitutional arrangements. Um, so if you're trying to manage the whole country to, to step somewhere, particularly when jurisdiction is divided over the particular topic, obviously it complicates it politically. Um, but um, it is certain that both provinces uh, and sorry, not just both. I mean, provinces, municipalities, indigenous governments, the federal government, all are going to have to play a role and, and work out how to cooperate if, if we really want to Canada to make this big transition over the coming few decades. Now, um, if, if carbon pricing, and I'm assuming that carbon pricing still would play a role in your policy mix, what are some of the other policy levers that government can pull to accelerate uh, decarbonization? So because we en emphasize this kind of sector and regional approach, we feel it's important to have a policy mix. Um, and so you will, you by combining different kinds of policy, you can actually encourage change to go uh, faster. And also the, the, that appropriate mix may change at the stage or phase of the transition that you're at. So, for instance, some sectors we know, we kind of know what the solution is and we have the technologies pretty much at hand. So if you take a sector like um, uh, light duty vehicles, so that's cars and pickup trucks and things like that, it's now pretty much sorted out the battery electric uh, is the future for that sector. And you can see the major automobile manufacturers from Volkswagen, Ford, GM are are now bailing into that, following the lead of, of something like, say, a company like Tesla and so on. So here we have the technology. The question is, is it going to take us 10 or 15 years to switch our vehicle fleet, or is it going to take 20 or 25 years? And the difference makes a big difference in terms of emissions and also in terms of how far we push 
um, th this transition. On the other hand, there are other sectors. So you could take something like flying <laughs> or airplanes where the technology is really not um, very mature. Um, we don't quite know what to do about it. Probably it's going to be biofuels. They're beginning research on electron electric planes, but this is, you know, 10 years, 20 years out. So really one of the things we emphasize in this report that governments need to distinguish whether the sector they're looking at is ripe for acceleration or whether it's still in a kind of emergence emergence phase where we still, when you're in the emergence phase, you focus on R&D, um, experiments, trials, pilots, you test different business models, you test different technologies, so you can find out what, what ones work the, work the best. But really the, the strategy we're putting forward is saying, instead of just kind of muddling along and letting markets kind of sort things out, but with a, with a vague push that we're headed that way, what, what we really need to do is pick the sectors where we know the solutions and push the rollout. And then in the other sectors, encourage R&D and experimentation. Well, that seems like a sensible approach. Now, we saw the, uh, the federal government uh, introduce a major update to its uh, climate and energy policies in mid-December. The response from clean energy advocates and, and climate activists was very positive. I saw a lot of comments about how we now have a, po a policy uh, sweep that will get us to net zero in 2050. So if the federal government seems to have been doing you know, a better job, what does it need to do differently than it's doing now? So I, I guess what I would say is that um, um, carbon pricing is an important part of the, the, the recipe, but really what we need is uh, an acceleration of, 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 um, poli of policies, and these can be regulatory policies or incentives like uh, tax breaks or, uh, and so on that really accelerate change in the sectors that are ripe for it. So I would really like uh, a big push on the electrification of transport. And there are two sides to that. One is to encourage consumer uptake, um, but the other is also to encourage the development of the vehicle supply chain, the manufacturing industry for electric vehicles in Canada. So since we know that EVs are going to be the future of transport, but most of the auto industry in Canada is really based around producing uh, internal combustion engines. If we want the Canadian economy to flourish in coming decades, we really need to get in early, if you like, on building electric vehicles. And that means the ba battery plants, the supply chain. Now, Canada is really quite well positioned with our mining industry, the vehicle assembly industry, IT, lots of sectors that we have all the bits you need. But it's going to take some encouragement from the government. Industrial policy is what that used to be it used to be called, in order to encourage that we get in quickly at the beginning of this this new industry. And I just emphasize that electric vehicles, you know, they're they're a kind of thing in themselves. They're a cool thing to drive. They're the future of the driving. But they're also linked in many ways to other aspects of the economy, like new materials. Uh, robotics, ultimately to autonomous vehicles that drive themselves. So in order to keep a key role in all those technologies, the auto industry and building the auto industry of the future around electric and, and in some cases, fuel cell vehicles, particularly for heavy goods movement, really is critical. So that's an example where the transition is accelerating and we should go all in, in order to make sure Canada has an economic uh, place in this, in this future. James, this will be my last question. And I'm curious what you think of my argument that we're about 20 years, give or take, into the current energy transition. And the third decade of big transitions like this tend to be very disruptive. This is the where the, the, the new technologies become competitive with the old technologies, and they begin to displace those old technologies in the marketplace and you know systems get disrupted and consumer uh, 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 buying habits and so on it's, it's a, and, and i think the 2020s are going to be that decade for these uh, electrification and, and other clean energy technologies which has obvious policy implications so would you agree with my argument or or disagree um 
I think fundamentally I agree. The only nuance I'd attach is that it's slightly different from sector to sector. Um, so I think that on electric power generation, we know how to make low carbon energy and Canada's grid is already pretty decarbonized in most provinces. Alberta and Saskatchewan really are the big nuts to crack and they have a task ahead of them. I think electrification of transport is really going to speed up this decade. And that will be disrupted, particularly for the existing oil and gas producers because gradually the market for gasoline and eventually diesel is going to dry up. Now in trucking, it's you know heavy goods movement. We're not there yet. Maybe it's battery, could well be hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen, the hydrogen economy is really, I think, important uh, uh, growth opportunity going forward. Other sectors like agriculture, we're several decades out. But I think in many of the things that will touch consumers, uh, particularly people living in cities and things, you're right. The next decade is going to be really uh, really disruptive and exciting too, but for some old legacy industries, it's going to be problematic. And so that's one of the reasons we need policies to retrain workers, policies to encourage regional economic de development, diversification, um, so we can exploit some of the new opportunities in a, in a low carbon economy. James, thank you very much. It was a very interesting conversation. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you.